Welcome to Encounter, an opportunity for you to encounter God any time, any place it's convenient for you. I'm Pastor Sherry Heapis, and I'm the Associate Pastor of Andrew Chapel United Methodist Church, and I wanted to welcome you to my home just outside of Bangkok, Thailand. Through this season of Encounter, we are exploring Lent. We're exploring the purpose in which Jesus journeys toward the cross in obedience to God and where God is calling each of us in this season of our own lives. Through this episode, you're going to find a scripture, prayer, a time of meditation, a time for you to explore more deeply where God is calling you. And so join me on this journey today. Today's scripture comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 2, verses 13 through 22. Hear the word. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found the people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, Take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, What sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, This temple has been under construction for 46 years, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the words Jesus had spoken. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me, please? Holy God, not because of me, not even through me, but in spite of me and all of my shortcomings, may your perfect word reach your people. Amen. Friends, what is it about human nature that makes us love righteous indignation so much? I really wish I could understand it in myself and in others. I see it in all sorts of facets of life. I don't think of myself as one that would condone violence, and yet I find myself cheering and laughing hysterically when the bad guy gets annihilated in the movie Home Alone. And I know I'm not the only one. Whether it's movies or music or catching up on the local news, we aren't all that concerned when someone gets what we feel like is coming to them. I'm not sure how much of my perspective is influenced by growing up in the South, but it is definitely prevalent in our music. Whether Earl had to die or a Louisville slugger took out both headlights, it was acceptable because domestic violence and adultery are wrong. Maybe through music and film, we're able to live vicariously through these stories because we know we really shouldn't act this way in real life. Or maybe we hope that we're never in those types of situations that would warrant such anger. There are situations that, while terrible, can feel personal and have a horrible impact on our lives. And then there are situations that can amp up that righteous indignation to a whole new level. Often, those situations don't just leave our blood boiling, but it seems like the ripple effects leave many shaking their heads and willing to join in to our response. When we notice someone vulnerable being bullied by a group, like when a small child gets picked on the playground by a group of kids three grades older than them, or an elderly person gets pushed around by a group of disrespectful teenagers, these situations often cause us to interject in spite of any consequences because we understand that doing nothing only perpetuates the injustice. Personally, I find it infuriating to go to a local grocery store and find infant formula locked up behind glass. First, because we live in a world where people take things that don't belong to them. Ultimately, someone pays for the store's losses. And also, the idea that babies are going hungry because their parents can't afford to feed them because the costs are so high. And innocent children are lost in the shuffle and suffering. It makes me so sad. And this is on a small scale. Meanwhile, Wars rage across our globe and hostages are being held by terrorist organizations and those that stand up against injustice are silenced by authoritarian governments. Lord, 
hear our prayer. We can spend so much time today discussing the hurts we see in the world and how much is broken. And in many ways, we can feel sadness and disappointment and even anger that the injustice is so often part of our everyday lives that we, and things that we notice and things that we don't. Today's scripture comes from the Gospel of John, and it's one of those small number of stories about Jesus that is found in all four Gospels. This account has some minor nuance from the others, but the most important seems to be its chronology. The synoptics, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, I'm sorry, (laughs) let me back that up, our synoptics, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, place the story toward the end of Jesus's ministry, in the days before he is arrested and led to the cross. But John, however, offers this story at the very beginning of Jesus's ministry, just after his first miracle, or sign as John calls them, is made manifest. Friends, it's one of the things that I appreciate about this gospel is its intentionality. John is more concerned with sharing with all of us the death and resurrection of Jesus will change everything. Because of Jesus, the temple will not be essential in the way that it was before. That through Christ, we will worship, we will confess our sin, and we are forgiven. We are reconciled through the love and continual faithfulness that we are given because of the triune God. Bishop Will Williman says that John interprets Jesus' strange words and deeds by letting us in on this messianic secret that Jesus' body is the new temple, the new place of worship, the new connection between God and humanity. Destroy that temple on a cross and God will restore it in three days at resurrection. It's a beautiful understanding that John weaves throughout his telling of the story. And yet so many of us are drawn to the anger. I wonder if it comes from our own sinfulness. We know that Christ is without sin, and we know that this image of Jesus making a whip of cords and driving out the money changers is so very different from the same Jesus who tells his disciples to let the little children come to him. We hold all of these images of Jesus, the Jesus that heals, whether from a word, someone reaching out in desperation, or him placing his own hands on the one in need. There are images of Jesus as the shepherd, the fisherman, the great comforter, the resurrected savior that cooks breakfast for his friends who have so recently denied and abandoned him. There are so many parts of Jesus that we hold dear. And yet this one seems so vastly different and can be hard for us to match this with all the others. Some of us shy away from an angry Jesus. Maybe we've been hurt or been on the other end of violent yelling and fear. And so this story doesn't comfort us and may actually be difficult. And some of us love this image. I heard one pastor say that too often we try to emulate the turn the other cheek Jesus. And ultimately all we do is turn into a doormat for Jesus. All the while forgetting that Jesus turned over tables. Friends, I think that pastor didn't fully get it. And I sometimes wonder if we hold on to this idea that because Jesus turned over the tables, then we are justified anytime we lose our temper on behalf of our Christian ideals. I think there's got to be some nuance for us to more deeply understand. It's an important story from the Gospels that gives us insight into who Jesus is and what's important to him. This encounter makes it clear that Jesus is, in fact, not a doormat, but he's not a bully either. And if our goal is to become more like Jesus, I think we need to try to understand why Jesus reacts this way. It was common practice at the time for people to make their sacrifices at the temple of a young, unblemished animal. And if you remember, Joseph and Mary went to the temple to offer their sacrifice after Jesus was born. Often in the long journey that people would make to Jerusalem from their villages and towns, the animals would become injured along the way or weary from the journey. And so this idea of an unblemished animal being offered in Jerusalem, it actually aided the people in keeping their commands of God because they couldn't bring it on their own. They needed to get it there. In addition, 
the Roman money in circulation at that time carried the image of Caesar. And so once again, in order to pay the temple tax, it was not acceptable to pay with these coins. And so the money needed to be exchanged in accordance with the law. So the intent behind the practice wasn't bad. Willem notes that it was previously common practice for the animals and the money changers to be held in the nearby Kidron Valley, but not in the temple itself. It's the location of such activities being in one area of the temple, the one area that the Gentiles were allowed to enter and pray that becomes the problem. Commentator W. Hulett Glower notes that while the place appeared to fulfill its function, closer inspection revealed that it had forgotten its purpose. It had been taken over by the buyers and the sellers, the consumers and the marketers who know how to fill the pews and meet the capital campaign goals. Hold on a minute, friends. Who is he talking about here? He goes on to say, the ways the world invades the church gradually, subtly, never intentionally, always in service of the church and its mission. And soon the church is full of cattle, sheep, turtle doves, and money changers. So I guess I don't have to ask what this passage has to do with us now. It's so easy to look at the scripture and think of the many ways we are justified in being angry about, especially within our lives and our churches. We may feel empowered to turn over tables and grab the whips, but I want to caution us that in all four of the gospels, we never see Jesus gathering his disciples and handing out whips so that they can all come together in force. Jesus is grieved and angry at how many people are being inhibited from truly worshiping God, of reconciling with God because of the systems and the practices that are getting in the way. For many of us gathered in this sacred space together, we come from different perspectives and backgrounds. And I wanna acknowledge that. For some of us, we don't have the opportunity to come into a church sanctuary to worship. And so we make space for that here. For many in the exclusively digital space, maybe we, we are geographically inhibited from worship. Maybe we're here because of deep harm that has been done to us by the church. Friends, I can list a multitude of ways that you could have been hurt, and I won't do that here. But I will offer that you are deeply loved by God. And that any time one is kept from truly worshiping and reconciling with God due to human interference, well, we see how Jesus feels about that. If you've been harmed, I'm truly sorry. The church universal has some work to do and with God's help, we can be healed. And while I know that the church that I pastor, Andrew Chapel United Methodist Church is far from perfect, we are trying to love others the way that Jesus taught us to. I know that many of us come to this space as faithful churchgoers. Encounter is a place where you come to continue to grow in your faith. Many of us spend so much time within the walls of the local church. We give of our time, our talent and treasure to support the ministries of our local church because we believe that God calls us there to help make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. We have felt the Holy Spirit work within our lives through this community of faith, and we want others to experience God's redeeming grace. And yet, we often get sidetracked. Friends, I am too guilty of uttering the words, we've always done it this way. We're in our first ministry, our first, excuse me, we're in our first year of Dr. Tim's ministry with us. And it's truly my first experience of not being the new kid. I'm so used to moving and being the new person to the team, and it was exciting for me to pass along the institutional knowledge and history of our congregation. So as new ideas are being offered, I'm now the one saying, wait a minute, I'm not sure how the people are gonna like that. We do things this way here at Inger Chapel. And if we aren't careful, we can find ourselves in habits or our own cherished programs or ministries that actually get in the way of where God may be calling us to be. We can become a church that entertains instead of leading people to worship God in spirit and truth. 
And for all the ways that we fail, I think we too see how Jesus feels about that. Friend Lent, friends, Lent offers us an opportunity to ask whether or not we are destroying the temple. Each week I come back to this idea that Jesus went to the cross with purpose, that through his deep love for us and in full obedience to God, he doesn't waver. Lent is a time for us to examine our own hearts and the purpose of becoming more like Christ. We are created in the image of God, and on this side of heaven, the Holy Spirit continues to shape us to reflect that image back into the world. Jesus was setting things right in the temple that day. He didn't lose his temper. He was showing with deep intentionality that the temple had gotten off track. And it's time for us as Christians to look at our lives, to look at our church, and to see where we may have gotten off track. We want to be a place where people can come and experience God. We don't want to be a place that inhibits people from making their way to God. And so it's time for us to take a hard look at ourselves and see what tables Jesus might overturn in our own lives. We don't get to join in on the righteous indignation today. Today is a time for us to come in humility before God and say, I am yours. Help me to be more like Jesus. Take away from me whatever you need to do to cleanse me of where I am a barrier. Help me to be more like Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. For today's prayer, I wanted to offer a prayer of confession. You'll find the words printed on the screen beside you. And so you can follow along. Please say aloud the words that are in bold. And so my hope is that if you're not in a quiet place that you can be alone with God, feel free to press pause and come back when you can. As you, as we've talked about before with prayer, we have the opportunity to offer prayers of petition of lament. And today we offer a prayer of confession, a time where we recognize our failings before God. And so would you join me? Dear God, thank you for all that is good, for creation and humanity, for the stewardship that you have given us for this planet Earth, for the gifts of life and of one another, for your love, which is unbounded and eternal, O oh, Thou most holy and beloved, my companion, my guide upon the way, my bright and evening star, we repent of the wrongs that we have done. We have wounded your love. Oh God, heal us. We stumble in the darkness. Light of the world, transfigure us. We forget that we are your home. Spirit of God, dwell in us. Eternal Spirit, living God, in whom we live and move and have our being, all that we are, have been, and shall be in is known to you, to the very secret of our hearts, all that rises to trouble us. Living flame, burn into us, cleansing wind, blow through us, fountain of water, well up in us, that we may love and praise in deed and truth. Amen. I want to thank you for joining me in this episode of Encounter today. My prayer is that it was a time where you grew more deeply in your faith, a time that you connected with God. And along those lines, my hope is that you'll connect with us. You can comment on our YouTube page. You can connect with us by filling out a card at andrewchapelumc.org slash encounter. From there, you can let us know that you are worshiping with us. You can let us know that you have prayer concerns. Those can be either 
kept confidential with just me, or they can be passed along to our prayer ministry. And if the ministries of encounter are blessing your life, you can give to support the digital ministries of Andrew Chapel. Wherever you are, my prayer is that you are finding a way to connect with a faith community. And so if you need help finding one in your local area, if you're not local to Northern Virginia, feel free to reach out to me. I would love to help you find a faith community. We're grateful that you're choosing to continue to grow in your faith alongside of us. You're a vital part of our community and we are grateful that you are here. And so my hope is that you'll continue to join us throughout this series, that you'll continue to grow in your journey with God, and that you'll continue to listen to that still small voice of where God is calling you in this season of life. And so may you fill God's presence wherever you may go. Go with grace, friends. Mm -hmm.